Good afternoon. Good afternoon from Berlin, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Kirk. As president of FEAT, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you at today's event on the role of batteries recycling for the transition to a circular economy during the industry work week. This event will allow to present the opportunities and challenges for the waste management sector regarding the new regulation on batteries proposed by the Commission in December 2020. Our Commissioner Sinkevicio said, this innovative EU proposal is the first big push to the circular economy under the new circular economy action plan. And in fact, it's the first proposal of the new action plan and after the single-use plastic directives, directive to set sector-specific mandatory requirements for recycled content in products. For the waste management sector, the first cornerstone of mandatory recycled content means that new opportunities will open not only for batteries, but also for other sectors soon. In this context, let me stress that the waste management sector is a reliable and strategic partner for reaching the objectives of circular economy under the European Green Deal. However, certain important points must be taken into account when it comes to recycling efficiency, mandatory recycled contact and collection of waste batteries. First, we clearly welcome new ambition targets for recycling efficiency for batteries. Our companies are determined to take the challenge to, to innovate and to make the required investments. But we have to face that the proposed target cannot be achieved by the current recycling technology. So far, there is simply no method available to achieve the affordable extraction of all different materials indicated in the proposal on an industrial scale. Research, innovation and time is required to achieve the necessary techno technological progress that enables to achieve the ambitious recycling targets. European battery recyclers are determined to ensure higher recycling efficiencies, but in order to achieve them, targets should be postponed in order to be adapted to technological capacities. Second point, mandatory recycled content. The breakthrough with this new reg regulation must not distract from the fact that higher ambitions for recycling content are required. In a context where critical raw materials will become increasingly rare, mandatory recycled content contributes to higher material efficiency and closes the loop required for a stable supply of materials for European battery production. Mandatory recycled content is essential to close the loop. Thus, it should not be restricted to industrial, electric vehicle and automotive batteries. Mandatory recycled content must also encompass portable batteries which suit particularly well for recycled content, such as cobalt and nickel in laptop batteries. Let's not wait for another decade. Let's make circularity of portable batteries now. Third point, collection targets and deposit return schemes. It must be welcome that collection targets for portable batteries have been increased. The return of a high proportion of waste batteries is a prerequisite for a modern and circular economy. Mandatory integration of recycled content will only be achieved if sufficiently batteries are collected. However, for a proper handling and correct disposal of batteries, higher collection targets of at least 80% for all types of batteries are needed. Also, with increasing energy density in lithium batteries, there is also an increased risk of a fire hazard in case of improper handling and incorrect disposal of lithium batteries. In order to prevent dangerous fires and to ensure the proper handling and disposal of batteries collection 
targets alone will not solve the problem. In order, therefore, we call for the European legislator to introduce an EU-wide duty on deposits return schemes for dangerous lithium batteries. So my conclusion is, the waste management sector is a strategic partner to achieve the objectives of the European Green Deal and plays a crucial role in the transi transition to a circular economy. At the same time, however, the sector needs the right framework conditions to live up to its full potential. First, practicable recycling efficiency targets. Secondly, more ambitious mandatory recycling content. Third, higher collection targets and mandatory deposit return schemes must be integrated into the batteries proposal. Now, I'm looking forward to the contributions of our esteemed guests on the role of batteries recycling for the transition to a circular economy. Thanks for your attention. And now I will introduce our moderator for this evening, Claire Duhl. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. And welcome to all of those of you who are joining us for this event. More than 300 people registered for the event on battery recycling, energizing the green transition, which is part of EU Industry Week and organized by FEED, the European Waste Management Association. The event is being recorded. So we're first going to hear from some experts who've been involved in drawing up the new proposed regulation on batteries and waste batteries. Then we'll hear from a member of the European Parliament's Industry Research and Energy ITRE Committee and from some leading voices in the European recycling industry to see what they're doing, their contribution to the circular economy and their thoughts on the proposed regulation. So please do tweet using hashtag EU Industry Week or using the Twitter handle at FeedInfo. And of course, we want to hear from you. So on the Q&A, please do start putting your questions. And if there's somebody in particular that you want to answer your question, then that makes it so much easier uh, for us. We're going to kick off by hearing from Dr. Hartmut Stahl, senior researcher at the Urca Institute, a leading research and consultancy organization working for a sustainable future. Dr. Stahl was involved in a study of the DG Environment uh, Directive, the current batteries directive, and supported the impact assessment of the proposed regulation. So Dr. Stahl's going to set the scene with some of the main trends in battery production, consumption, collection and recycling rates. Uh, Dr. Stahl, over to you. Thanks a lot, Claire, for the introduction. Yes, um, before starting with the discussion on the new proposal on batteries, I think it's quite helpful to understand some basic data uh, on the batteries uh, and the battery market. And to start with, I would like to, to raise a question, why do we actually need a new legislation? I mean, the answer to this question is actually quite simple. Um, the current version of the batteries directive was actually developed about 20 years ago. So that's a long time ago. And as you know, the um, the battery sector is actually quite dynamic. So there are a lot of innovations and just think about our daily life. Um, batteries have become a very important, um, very important uh, to many uh, things of our daily life. So just think about the smartphone. So the, there are new technological developments, like for example, the drones or uh, these uh, common household uh, robots like vacuum cleaners. So all these developments actually need uh, new types of batteries. And then there's just one thing, 20 years ago, there was no, nothing like Tesla or other electric vehicles. So, and these electric vehicles, vehicles actually have become the main driver for the whole uh, battery um, sector. Can we please switch on to the to the next slide? 
and also one more. I've discussed this already. Let's just go on to the next slide, please. So we start with some some data on on the battery sector. So what we are looking right now, that's the batteries being placed on the market in the EU. The volumes or the amounts of batteries are given in tons, and we're looking at the current current situation starting from 2020 uh, up to the year uh, 2035. So we are looking at different categories of batteries being placed on the markets. So we have the portable batteries, we have the automotive batteries, and we have the industrial batteries. So far, we're excluding electric vehicle batteries. So what you can see there basically that the, the battery sector is dominated by the automotive batteries. So we're talking about a, a roughly 1 million tons of batteries being placed on the market uh, per year. And only about half the amount that um, uh, these are uh, the industrial batteries. So about roughly, let's say half a million uh, industrial batteries are placed on the market. And then coming to the portable batteries, that's basically the uh, these typical non-rechargeable AA batteries or triple A batteries. They make up for the, the highest share of, of the portable batteries. So that's again about roughly half of the industrial batteries. So we're talking about 200 to 250,000 tons of batteries of portable batteries being placed in the market. So what has been missing so far, that's the scenario for the electric vehicle. So if you go to the next slide, that's basically the, the same picture, but now we have included, included the electric vehicle. And this shows that the electric vehicle in future will clearly dominate uh, the whole uh, battery sector. So we have a very strong increase uh, of electric vehicle batteries. They're going up to about 4 million tons of battery uh, of electric vehicle batteries in 2035. So if you go on to the next slide, please. We in principle have the same picture, but now we're looking no longer on the different categories of batteries. So no longer um, automotive batteries and so on. But now we're focusing on the chemistry. So we have the chemical types of batteries. And what we can see there, it's, it's roughly the same picture. So the green batteries, these are the, the lead acid batteries. So that's basically, first of all, the automotive batteries. As you know, they are only uh, lead acid batteries, basically. They make up for about 1 million tons of batteries. And in addition, we have also the industrial batteries which are right now mainly uh, lead acid batteries. So they make up for about 1.5 million uh, tons of batteries being placed on the market. But then as we have already seen, uh, it's again dominated uh, by the electric vehicle batteries. And as we all know, these are the lithium ion batteries. So they make up for the, for the highest share of the entire battery sector in the future. So, if we move on from batteries being placed on the market to batteries being collected, there the picture is totally different. The, the market is no longer dominated by lithium ion battery, but we can clearly see that it's uh, more or less the lead acid batteries, at least for the time being and for the very near future. So that's basically similar to what we have seen on, on lead acid batteries being placed on the market. It's about 1.4 million uh, tons of batteries being collected and collected means at the same time um, also being recycled. So what is different from the, from the slide before, these are the lithium ion batteries. As I already mentioned, they are no longer dominating the market, but we can see only an increase of the lithium ion batteries being collected starting, well, let's say at the, at the end of this decade and, and the uh, years 2030 and the following years. So if you think about lithium ion batteries are dominated by the electric vehicle batteries. So this means simply at the beginning, it was rather unclear how long an electric vehicle batteries will last, but now, 
um, we expect that the um, electric vehicle battery will last the entire life of the of the vehicle. So we assumed about 15 years in average for a lifetime of a lithium ion battery. That simply means uh, if a vehicle is, is put on the market right now, the battery will, will last for about uh, 15 years. And that means that it is it will be collected only after 2035. Therefore, we can see this increase only in, well, yeah, starting with about 2030. Let's move on to the next slide. I mean, when we consider the battery directive as it is, as it is right now, there are some important shortcomings um, of the current uh, battery directive. First of all, it's about the collection. So there's insufficient collection of portable battery. That's a major shortcoming of the current batteries directive. We have currently the 45% collection target, but that simply means that uh, the other way around, more than half of the total portable batteries being placed on the market are lost. That means batteries accumulate over many years in landfills and somewhere else. And that means batteries present a steadily growing risk to the environment. So that clearly means that one of the target is in the new uh, legislation, a much higher uh, collection rate for portable batteries. If we move on to the next slide, there we can see the mass flows of the portable batteries only. So once again, we're looking from 2020 to 2035 and the, the dark blue, the highest column, that's again the portable batteries being placed on the market. And if we consider what is actually collected of portable batteries, that's an average on the EU average on the EU, EU level, it's, it's about 45, um, percent of the batteries being placed on the market is actually collected. So, and you can see the losses there. We have differentiation between uh, the batteries ending up in the muni municipal waste. That's the, the smallest, uh, smallest column, the violet um, column. And apart from batteries ending up in municipal waste, there are two other main uh, sources of losses and that's first of all uh, the batteries uh, in uh, waste electronic equipment, which is not removed uh, when recycling the electronic waste and therefore also the batteries are lost. And then we have uh, losses due to the export. Uh, of batteries or equipment uh, where the batteries are incorporated. So this clearly shows that a higher target uh, is required. So in the, in the current version of the, the new legislation, there's a target of 65% collection rate for portable batteries increasing to 70%. So if we move on, there's one other major shortcoming of the current directive, and that's I already mentioned that the electric vehicle batteries are the main driver for the battery sector. And in the current version of the batteries directive, they are simply lithium ion batteries. They are not mentioned in this directive. So the, and in addition, the batteries directive is not orientated uh, towards the recovery of critical materials. So that means that the resources actually do not uh, really play a major role in the, in the batteries directive. So in addition, uh, most of today's recycling processes for lithium ion batteries focus on well, housing, but also on cobalt nickel, but not on lithium. So that is also one issue uh, which is addressed now in the, in the new proposal. If you have a look at the lithium ion uh, batteries again, and in this case, we're looking specifically only at the lithium contained in lithium ion batteries. So what we are looking at is the amount of lithium uh, collected uh, from the lithium ion batteries. So the, the amount of um, lithium contained in batteries is rather small. It's only about one, 2% of the entire battery. So therefore, the overall amount of lithium 
being collected with the battery is rather small. So in, in 2035, we're talking about roughly uh, 9,000 tons of lithium. But so far, there is no specific recovery target of lithium. So that's basically what you can see in the in the light blue, in the smallest uh, column. That's what we consider the baseline right now. If there is no target for the collection or for the recovery of lithium in lithium ion battery, that's what we would uh, would have to expect in this um, in this baseline scenario. So if we're looking at a recovery target of 70% uh, percent recovery of lithium, then, uh, then that's what we can see in this green column. That's uh, the measure we, we investigated into. So that clearly shows the difference between what we expect to be the baseline and a higher target uh, for lithium recovery. So much as an introduction to the um, to the mass flow of batteries and to some basics of the current version of the batteries directive, and also looking forward to the changes we expect from the from the new regulation on batteries. So thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hartmut. And indeed. Uh the new regulation we can see is really needed. Just a, a couple of questions, because you mentioned, of course, the collection targets on uh, non uh, on portable batteries, uh, that they were 45 percent, they're going up to 65 percent. Um, why have we only got targets on portable batteries? What about non portable batteries? Well, um... In principle, of course, there could also be uh, targets on, on automotive batteries and also on industrial batteries. But what we have to, to keep in mind or what we, what we should know is that there, so far there aren't any data on the automotive batteries and in particular on, on um, industrial batteries. Therefore, of course, it's rather difficult to set a target if you do not have any data on uh, on these kind of batteries. In addition, we also have to be aware that it's also from a methodological point of view rather difficult to to develop a target uh, for 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 these kind of batteries, um, because it's uh, the approach that we have for the portable batteries that we're looking at uh, the batteries being placed on the market and collected that does not work for in particular for for the industrial batteries, because. Uh, when it comes to the industrial batteries, there's a great variety of different applications and also the lifetime is very different. So we have potentially from just a few years lifetime up to about 20 years lifetime. Therefore, this approach for the portable batteries would not work for the, for the industrial batteries. And also an, an alternative, so that means uh, the batteries being available for collection it's rather difficult to develop this amount uh, without knowing, well, for example, the amounts being exported. That's one uh, of the main issue. And also to calculate or to develop this amount being available without knowing the, the different lifetimes and the different shares of the applications of, um, of uh, industrial batteries makes it very difficult to develop a, a target. Understood. Well, Thank you very much, Hartmut. Let me now introduce somebody who really knows uh, all about the previous directive and about the new uh, regulation. Jose Rizzo Martin is a senior expert in DG Environment in the Division on Circular Economy and Green Growth, and he is going to give his insights on what this new regulation means for the battery recycling industry. So, Jose, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to participate in your meeting. I will try to show you some of the most important uh, aspects in relation to to recycling. Do you prefer me to do the presentation? You do it yourself. I have already uploaded uh, Mr. Okay, Martin. thank you. Go go ahead, please. Just, uh, let me know when. You... Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Next slide. Next. 
The proposal is a complex proposal. Uh, the reason for that is because we are trying to address all the problems, all the aspects in relation to the life cycle of the batteries. You know, the proposal we used to say there are two legs, one leg setting conditions for the batteries to be placed on the European market, and the second leg is the circular economy, the typically relation with end of life provisions. Just for you to know, that you know what here in darker uh, green or darker brown it presents the aspects specifically dealing with uh, this circular economy. Uh, you go from recycling efficiencies, recycled content, uh, performance and durability, provision of second life, and collection targets for waste batteries. The result of this is a really complex proposal. I can accept all type of criticism. If we move ahead, please. Next slide. You see that we have the result is also complex because the life of the batteries is also very complicated. You have 13 chapters, 79 articles, 14 annexes, and even the whole framework is not completed. The Commission is proposing to complete it with more than 30 pieces of secondary legislation in coming years. Again, when you deal with entire life cycle as a product of a complex product, you enter in a totally new way of making policies. Next slide, please. What are the main assumptions in relation to recycling and recovery of materials? Already mentioned by uh, Harmut is, uh, where are the losses in the life cycle of the battery? And this is a graphic, I hope it can be understood, that shows you the stars where the action are needed. Uh, you need to diminish losses due to materials that are dissipated in use. You need to increase the quality of the batteries, of course, and you have to increase the places of the recovery. When the battery arrives to the end of life, you have to increase the collection. You have to ensure, and this is the second green star, that the collection doesn't stop there, but everything which is collected goes to recycling. And something that is also new in this piece of regulation and this proposal is that the result of recycling, not only from batteries, from any other cycle, goes to new products, goes to new batteries. Is if you want to show this in a very simple way, the, the part of the cycle, which is the dark green, has to be almost ideally as large as the part of the cycle which is now dark blue. Increase collection, increase recycling, ensure that recycling is able to contribute to closing the loop. Next slide, please. Talking about collection, please next slide too. The collection targets we have been considering and proposing we, we used to say they are really ambitious, but well, on that, you may have different opinions. The current collection target, as already pointed out by Harmut, is not enough. We are sure. We have the opinion, we consulted the stakeholders, politicians, member states. 45% is almost reached now by two thirds of member states, not to say even more, and is not driving upwards the sustainability of the, of the proposed, of the industry or the cycle eh, of the batteries. On the other hand, industrial automotive and EV batteries, the, what we have now is some kind of target of 100%. It's a no losses policy, no battery from industrial automotive and electric vehicle uses or types should be lost. This is the idea. Therefore, no need for a target. We try to ensure that they continue to be close to 100% as this is what the industry is telling us all the time. While they say 100%, it could be more than 90. We could accept that the collection rate, the actual collection rates now are more than 90 and we want them to continue in this way are going up even to 100%. But in any case, and this is something new, we are going to propose a reporting system for non-portable batteries to be sure that there is information about the, the, the final, I wouldn't say fate, destination of these batteries. It is true the the information we have is not very good. We are sure they go beyond 90, but we want that the, the status of these batteries is duly accounted for and, and reported. Therefore, in 2025, we propose a waste portable uh, collection rate for waste portable batteries of 65. And at the end of 2030, 
uh, the 70%. Next slide, please. Go, please. Recycling targets continue contain one of the most important new features, lithium. Lithium batteries were a sort of elephant in the chamber because everybody knew they were there, but now body was uh, dealing with this type of batteries, uh, legally speaking. Mm, in general, we propose from the Commission a general increase of recycling efficiencies. There is a period of transformation and the new recycling efficiency values will start in 2025 and 30. And on this, we, on the one hand, complete increase the recycling efficiencies for the batteries and propose quantified targets for the recovery of materials. Some of them, cobalt, copper, lead, nickel, and lithium. Uh, you know the difference between recycling efficiencies and material recovery. The material recovery targets proposed cannot work unless the recycling efficiencies are increased. For instance, you cannot talk about the recovery of lithium if the recycling efficiency of lithium ion batteries is not set at the level we are proposing. The contribution from people like Harmut and company was essential to identify what the targets uh, could be. It's something really a novelty in the new proposal. Next slide, please. And as I said, another, the last step is to consider how the material which is recovered not only from the recycling of batteries, but from any other recycling activity can be integrated into the production of new batteries. This is the minimum level of recycled contents. Some stakeholders, politicians, member states say, but you are going to propose it too late, but there is a general, a very precautionary, very conservative approach. We don't want this introduction to distort the market of secondary materials and the risks are clear. Uh, producers may go to buy these materials outside the European Union, which is not a bad idea in itself, but we want to promote the circularity internally in the European Union, or they could try to have new virgin materials, new extractive activities to complete this, this cycle. But the idea is, as I say, to use secondary materials of any kind for new batteries. And the last slide from my side, Please go ahead. We, the Commission is proposing all that in a format of a regulation. No individual decisions, all member states, all recyclers within the European Union would be subject to the same conditions, no distortions of the market. Why? Because we have identified that one of the problems in the, in the market of secondary materials within the European Union is due to the lack of full harmonization. Member states, Recyclers, they may have different understanding of the different provisions of what the obligations are. Some member states may be tempted to set uh, barriers to trade, and this is something that should be avoided at any price. That's why a regulation is considered to be the best instrument, and that's why the Commission is proposing a regulation. That's all from my side. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Jose. I wanted to pick up on something you were saying about the recycling efficiency values, that they will start in 2025. Now, the industry, I know, is really keen uh, to get that calculation uh, method so that they are able to put the right investments in place. Can it be done before 2025? We have started, actually, to do it. With all due respect to the, to the institutions, it is for them to, to, first of all, to accept or not to propose alternative values. And to the dates, the Commission has launched internally with the Joint Research Center. I study, which is launching, is now being signed. Uh, I study to say what could be the methodology, what should be the alternative, how could we ensure that everything is ready for the date we are proposing. Jose, thank you. Do stay with us. I want to bring in somebody who uh, represents the institutions. Uh, the regulation, as we know, is uh, being discussed by the Council and the European Parliament, and one of the key committees in the Parliament is the ITRE Committee, and I'm delighted that we're joined by the Shadow Rapporteur for ITRE, Maria Spiraki, a Greek MEP from the EPP uh, group. Maria, um, just can you give us a few thoughts on the proposed regulation? Well, first of all, 
Good afternoon to everyone and thank you very much for having me in this very interesting exchange of views. I would, I would like to, to thank uh, also Mr. Jose Rizzo Martin for his presentation because I think that we have a basis in order to, to, to build upon. And by saying this, I would like to say that uh, we as co-legislators and also the industry, we have, allow me to say, common ground on building upon the, the, the new battery policy. And this common ground based on three parameters, that batteries placed in the EU market should be and must be, first of all, sustainable. Secondly, should become high performing. And third, should become safe all their life cycle. And by saying this, I think that it is, it is of paramount importance to know that the main, the main aspect we, we would like to focus is the aspect on, on investments in innovation. And uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, it is very important to, for all of us in the, in the, in the institutions that uh, 12 member states would jointly invest almost 3 billion of uh, euros into innovation in battery cell technology for electric vehicles and energy storage. And it is an initiative that it is establishing the EU as a hotspot for better innovation. And it is an initiative that it gives uh, approximately 18,000 jobs and it can, could le leverage more than three times an amount of money in private invest investors. So we have batteries and the, the new project is an important project of common interest, as you already know, when it comes to to, to the way that we prioritize the, the issue of batteries. But we have a lot of issues to tackle. The first one, when it comes to the legislation, is to avoid overlapping. And this is the main issue that the, 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 the industry has already put on the table. By avoiding overlapping, I mean that we have, first of all, to work on the, on the implementation of the existing legislation and build upon it. It is important, according to my opinion, to, to check the implementation and to, to monitor the implementation at all levels. And I mean in sectoral level, and I mean raw material level, and I mean also in, in sustainable chemical level, in which I have a, a, a deep sensitivity when it comes to, to sustainable chemical as a co-author on the, on the motion for a resolution for chemical strategy for sustainability. But talking about the, the issue of, of recycling batteries, I would like to, to, to fully endorse the proposal of the Commission. And why this? This is why, because I think that we have to, to become pod pioneers worldwide by, by, by implementing and by enforcing this, the Circular Economy Action Plan 2. And uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan 2 give us, the, give us the opportunity, first, to create a secondary market of raw materials with uh, sustainable criteria. Second, to scale up sustainability in our raw material. And third, to have the opportunity to, to have new batteries from recycled materials and at the same time to increase the, the, the possibility to, to extend the life cycle of batteries by giving, by giving them a second life cycle. Allow me to say that uh, the key issue, according to my opinion, and I, I fully endorse the presentation of the Commission, is how can we collect batteries? And uh, we are uh, discussing a lot on the extended producer responsibility schemes and on, uh, on uh, uh, responsible disposal schemes, but uh, the case is that in, in many member states, including my country, Greece, the performance of collecting of uh, portable batteries are very low. And uh, by saying this, I would like to say that it is, it is of paramount importance to start engaging stakeholders, to start engaging SMEs, and to start engaging consumers in order to increase the level of collection. And this must be one of our main priorities. The second one, of course, must be the so-called passport of large batteries. We have to, to, to secure and to safeguard the disabilities of large batteries in order to keep them second life and in order to know where the, the large batteries are now working on. And uh, zero losses, according to my opinion, is one of the, of the targets that we have to, 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 to adapt. And the third one concerns the, the concerning when it comes to the industry. Because as, as, a, as you have already mentioned, a shadow rapporteur on behalf of FINTRA on the, on the regulation, the opinion that we will give concerning the regulation, I, I meet a lot of concerns when it comes to 
to the targets on recyclability and, and mandatory uh, recycling content at the same time on the second life of batteries. When it comes to the industry, the industry is telling to us that uh, we face a lot of contradiction by trying to implement these both targets. According to my opinion, it is not the case. We have to work on the increasing of, uh, of recyclability of the batteries, and uh, I have already ex uh, explained how can we do it. And at the same time, we have to, to, to invest in, in innovation in order to, to, to increase and to expand the lifetime of uh, large batteries. And it's not something that it has a contradiction. Of course, we can work further. Of course, we can avoid overlapping. But at the end of the day, we have to, to give incentives for, 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 for working of, of, of extended producer responsibility schemes. And at the same time, we have to understand that it is, it is Europe's time for batteries. Allow me to conclude with two numbers concerning the, the investments in batteries comparing to China. According to Vice President Sefcovic, who is involved in this project uh, at a very high level, investments in the EU battery sector was 60 billion last year, while China invested only 17 billion. Well, it is now our time to become pioneers, not only in terms of investment, but also in terms of technology, in terms of recyclability, and in terms of reusability of our batteries. Once again, thank you very much for your time and time for in your disposal for any questions. Thank you, Maria. So do you see this regulation as really an opportunity uh, for Europe's manufacturing and also the recycling industry to become circularity champions, you know, so that Europe does actually have the, the greenest batteries in the world? Yes, I think this is the case. I think it is a huge opportunity for our industry. Because now we have, as I have already told, uh, a adequate uh, amount of money in order to leverage uh, and it's not only public money but it is also private money for investments for for new technology and for breakthrough technology in batteries and at the same time we need to increase the rates of re recyclability and by saying this i insist on two aspects first is how can we raise awareness we have to raise awareness, not only for uh, the large batteries, but also for portable batteries. And uh, we can start by engaging uh, students at school. We can start by engaging NGOs and uh, uh, the, the, the people society. And second, and it is also important, we have to, to, to give a lot of incentives in terms of, uh, of uh, extended producer responsibility schemes in order to increase the, the amount and the quantity of, of batteries that we have available in order to recover the, the raw materials that we need for secondary, for secondary raw materials market. Maria, do stay with us. And I would like to bring back uh, Peter, uh, President of Feed, and Jose from DG in, in Environment. Peter, um, just to get your view on the level of ambition on the regulation, uh, we did hear in your opening remarks that you weren't so happy uh, with the collection targets. You think that they could be uh, much higher. Would you like to say a few words about that? If you if you want to close to close the loop with batteries, you have to um, keep in mind the whole circle, and uh, this starts with the proper collection. And uh, the collection targets are one of the main points to invite companies to really invest in the infrastructure, in facilities, and so on. If we see that there is an ambitious target of the policy coming, starting with the collection, ending with the mandatory recycling content, we will I think invite the companies all over Europe to fully um, take the opportunities, invest, and do their part for a, a better, better um, circular economy in this very important way stream. Um, Jose, Peter said in his opening remarks, if I remember correctly, uh, that the industry was keen on having an 80% uh, collection target. Uh, in your proposal, it's 65%. Uh, Jose, can you uh, say why it's not higher? Excuse me. 
I hope that sorry, Jose is there. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, no problem. Uh, yeah. Jose, you can see that, of course, the industry would very much like a higher target. If you could say uh, why you came up with the target of 65% and then I'll go to Maria. Uh, there is a technical discussion about how to measure collection rates. Now, uh, at the first step, we propose not to modify the current system. Uh, we move, we propose the current system to move to 65 and 70 percent. What I am going to do is not a magician uh, trick, but the 70 percent actually would mean 100 percent in what we call terms available for collection. Once you discount the amount of batteries that have been exported and you have discounted the amount of batteries simply vanished or lost, lost then you say 70-75% is the entirety of the batteries that are available for collection at the end of their life. It's something that you have to take into account. And we couldn't go beyond because, well, some people may think we are not only very ambitious but also irrealistic. In any case, Peter, uh, let me say it was the recycling industry who may be unhappy. Uh, member states may not be so happy with the targets we are proposing. Then probably a balanced position will be the final solution. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Peter, let me just go back to you on uh, Jose's answer about why they decided uh, to come up with the 65% collection uh, target, and then I'll, I'll bring in Maria. Yes, thank you. I know that there is a compromise between the um, opportunities uh, our companies uh, see and the challenges we want to achieve and the, uh, the position of the member states. This is for sure. And what um, uh, Alessandro mentioned is quite, quite true. Of course, we have to find a comparable measure system to see what is the reality in the difference. Uh, in the different states, but we asked our companies what is possible, what, what is the expectation, and we will not be able to change this regulation uh, all two years. We, we need a little more um, pressure on, on the way forward to circular economy. So, um, yes, I accept the challenge of a com correct measure system, but the signal, we want that target, uh, would be very welcome in the companies we want to invest. That we shouldn't forget if the targets are not ambitious enough. Um, um, I think uh, we we will not see all the investments which are possible. Uh, th uh, thank you, Peter. M Maria, of course, yes, it is a compromise uh, between. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, the industry and what the recycling industry want. The recycling industry want uh, more ambitious collection targets, as Jose indicated, uh, perhaps industry or member states uh, would like lower ones. Uh, how do you see this playing out in the ITRI committee? Well, according to my opinion, we need to, to have sustainable batteries by design. And this is our joint target, and I think that we can join forces in this regard. Of course, we have to take into account the concerns when it comes to the industry, because the, the industry of batteries are, are insisting that, as I have already told, there is a contradiction between the, the mandatory targets when it comes to, to mandatory recycled content and the, the targets that it, uh, it is setting on the issue of the second life of batteries. But we have to, to work together on a realistic basis, and that's why I, I support the, the proposal of the Commission because it's balanced, because it's based on an impact assessment, and because if we would really want to, to update the, the existing numbers, we can do it since the, 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 the industry is ready to invest in order to increase the recyclability of the, of the batteries and in order to, to increase the quantities of uh, the, the batteries that we have available for recycle. And uh, for, for this reason, I, I support the, the proposal of the Commission, and I think that we have to, to work stronger for the achievement of, of these targets, because we have to set targets to the paper which are achievable. Uh, but without this, I think that we, we face the danger for, for disappointing the, our, our, our voters, our, our citizens, and at the same time, uh, disturbing the market. 
Uh, thank you. There we are, Maria and Jose, with that uh, reality check. Peter, let me ask you, uh, the regulation, as Jose pointed out, is quite complex. Uh, what other provisions in this regulation are important for the recycling uh, industry? Um, the most important the most important points I mentioned, we really welcome the first, this is a very, very, uh, very important point. The first time we have a product specific um, minimal content. This is the right signal. Closing the loop means we need uh, to have a market for the recyclants. And so we very welcome this. And of course, we we know that uh, the, the targets are compromised. There always have to be compromises between the possibilities. But if you ask us as the uh, companies and the sector, our position is a little more. Um, and we, we need, this is a very important point, we need to find instruments um, to give the recyclates an economic value. This is a deposit system, really. Um, you, we need this because we see that the collection situation we have today, this is also a, a question in the, in the chat, uh, the collection today uh, is, is not perfect. We have to make a better collection and that means for the batteries, because here we are talking also about a, a fire risk, about a dangerous situation for the batteries, we need a separate collection, and this is the uh, the reason why we we ask for this instrument. So, Jose, at the moment, if my understanding is correct, uh, this uh, deposit and return scheme, which Peter is talking about, which is so needed, one to get collection rates up, but also to ensure the safe collection of batteries and that they don't become a fire risk. Um, that's, as I understand it, not in the directive at, at the moment. Is, is there a reason for that, Jose? Thank you. Yes, there is a reason for that. Uh, in the case of portable batteries, the studies we carried out or were carried out showed that uh, the complexity of the business would be huge, very, very huge. An enormous administrative burden for retailers, for distributors, and all that to, in the best of cases, increase three, four, five points, the collection rate of portable batteries. The alternative could be, and this is something we are considering, trading systems, for instance, in relation to uh, small electronics, uh, smartphones, cameras, and so on. This is something that uh, surely my colleagues dealing with the WE directive are already considering. But coming back to the portable, it was a lot of effort to have a very, very short game. However, in the case of big batteries, again, we considered that to do it. But uh, the, the idea of a small battery being lost has nothing to do with the battery of a car, an automotive battery being lost, to be, to be clear. Even in between, you may have light means of transport, e-bikes, where Again, we are talking about uh, of a battery which is not in a pocket, is cannot be lost so easily. But this idea was considered and to be honest, was dismissed very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Maria, I can see that you're nodding in agreement with what Jose has uh, said. Yes, because it is, it is important to explain to, to, to the public, first of all, but it is, uh, it is one of the issues that we face is how can we start cutting that red tape? And it's not our case to, to, to create further obstacles, to create further burdens. And in this regard, the, the case of, of having extended producer responsibility schemes or having responsible disposal schemes, it is related with the incentives that we can give. And according to my opinion, it is important to start exchanging best practices between member states in order to have a market based model. If you give back a portable battery, then you can have a cent. And if you are a kid and you using some kind of electronic games and you can give back 10 portable batteries, then you can uh, have a gift. But it is important to understand that we have to 
to, to involve people and to, to, to give incentives in order to increase the quantity of portable batteries that now we can recycle without any kind of, of, further, uh, of further regulatory burdens on them. But Peter, there we are. Um, there's concerns about that it will become too bureaucratic, too administratively uh, heavy for these deposit and return uh, schemes. Uh, Peter, what's your view on that? You know, um, in some member states, we have a deposit system for the automobile batteries, and it works. And it gives the batteries an economic value. And this increases the interest to not to see it as waste, but to see it as something uh, people should should work with uh, as a as a raw material as it is. And the the battery situation in the electronic uh, mobility at bikes at rollers, for example, is really an increasing problem. All our our cities face a huge increase of such. Um, such um, vehicles, such um, yeah, parts of electronic mobility in the whole, and how to how to win the batteries back if uh, if we don't give the people arguments to to uh, to take the batteries and help and and bring their their help to, to uh, hold them in the, in the circle. Um, the deposit system is not quite popular in the Europe. And even in Germany, the, the administration said, let's wait what the European Union says. And we say, okay, this is the usual argument. In the national member states, they say, wait on Brussels. Uh, Brussels say, oh, let's say uh, what the proper um, uh, examples are. Um, really? Circular economy is not happening by itself. It needs instruments. It needs a legal framework. And uh, our experience is if the people understand there is an economic value, they participate. Peter, let me just bring in one other issue because there were many provisions in the regulation. And to get your thoughts on the eco design. Uh, of, of batteries, are you are you happy with, with what is being proposed? We are to to say that again. We are more or less happy with the regulation. It's a progress. Eco design is the most important uh, instrument we have for the producers of batteries to produce in a way that allows to recycle later. Yes, this is this is the main step. And so um, I think we can work with this. Um, yeah, let's see. Let's see the proposal as compromise. And uh, if you, you would ask me, if, what are your main points? I wouldn't have proposals for the eco design. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And I would also like uh, to thank uh, Maria and uh, Rizzo and Jose rather for uh, joining us and for explaining so clearly uh, why the regulation is needed. And uh, of course, now it's going to go through the uh, parliamentary committees. So thank you very much for that. I would now, li now like to turn to the industry. Um, global demand for batteries, as we know, is set to increase and with it, of course, surging amounts of waste. So is the industry prepared? And what's the industry's view on the proposed regulations? We've heard uh, from Peter as president of FEED, but now we're going to hear from some industry leaders on what they're doing at the moment to contribute to the circular uh, economy and their views on the proposed uh, regulations. So let me first of all ask Ralph Mittermeier, who's the CEO of Saubermacher Dienstleistung, an Austrian company, uh, to present and tell us about what his company is doing uh, using innovative recycling technologies and contributing to the circular economy. Ralph, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and the very good spelling of our, <laughs> of our German company name. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the, uh, all the other speakers. Uh, that was a very, very interesting uh, thoughts here 
um, to Folio because they resemble uh, quite a lot of the things that you will find in my presentation. And I think, Claire, you are uploading the presentation. At least it seems. Yes, wonderful. Um, yes, next slide, please. Um, I just uh, uh, spend one slide on what is this company called Saubermacher um, is and what has this to do with batteries. So we are a mid-sized um, recycling and collection recycling company um, here headquartered in Austria, but in, in six countries all over Europe. And we have a specific uh, um, participation in a company called Redux, uh, which is based in Germany. And it has experience over 20 years um, in recycling batteries on the household, household batteries um, for production sites. And in total, we have recycled over 200,000 tons of batteries. And combining this knowledge together with an intensive research program, uh, which has now last almost for 12 years on lithium ion and batteries. Uh, um, next slide, please. Um, we, uh, we took a couple of years ago the decision to invest in the first industry grade uh, lithium ion recycling um, uh, plant um, in Bremerhaven in Germany. Uh, with a capacity, uh, technical capacity of over 20,000 tons per year, um, with an aim of a, uh, of a very high recycling, uh, on a very high recycling rate. Uh, as these uh, masses of batteries are not there yet on, on recycling, it's a combination plant which can also be used on classically household batteries on alkali, mangan, and zinc coal. But, um, uh, uh, to show you that there is already capacity there coming later on to the higher collection rates. Next, yes. next slide, please. Um, by reading the, the, uh, the proposal for the battery regulation, first of all, I want to congratulate in general um, uh, for, the, uh, for the regulation and for the proposal. I think it, it, it has a lot of key topics uh, included, but there are, for our side, there are there yeah, are uh, several points room for uh, for improvement, and therefore I have three three recommendations um, um, uh, uh, for for the next revision of the um, of the proposal. First of all, uh, very very smart and very good idea to focus on the recovery rate on specific elements uh, because we will see changes in battery chemistry in the next years, and we should be very smart. Uh, on what realistically um, our recycling rates, recovery rates, we do not want on specific elements. So we should even strengthen this and expand it maybe to manganese or aluminum. A very, very wise move um, moving in the, this direction. The second thing, and Jose, I was very pleased to hear um, that uh, you already have uh, ideas to um, um, to increase or, or come quicker with the calculation of the recycling efficiency. This is absolutely key from the industry to say we have, we have a target for efficiency, but we don't tell you how we calculate efficiency that we do only two or three years later. Um, that means no investment on the industry, because if we are not sure how these calculations are, and therefore from us a very, very clear um, uh, recommendation is to, with the establishment of the regulation, there should also be a clear calculation scheme on the calculation of the recycling efficiency. Otherwise, I wouldn't know uh, my in, uh, if I would go for an investment further on in the next step not by not being sure how efficiency can be calculated um, in the different things. And one of the most important things, and you have heard it over and over, is the increased collection rates. And there is, did you see the number? We recommend over 90% because we say we also want to have the batteries that you say that might be get lost somewhere. Um, therefore, we also, if necessary, ask for a deposit refund system. If, if we think that we have a 90% target on the um, on the waste collect uh, EU waste framework directive for PET in plastic, which is only um, a small um, a small small amount of the overall plastic um, um, plastic material. It's so important because it's 
uh, it is a it's a symbol and it's a very good material to be recycled. Therefore, it's it's very smart to do this. And most of the membership countries think they need a deposit refund system to achieve um, this 90 percent. Um, we think that especially for the household batteries, it's very important to go there because what we haven't seen in none of these graphics, also not from um, um, uh, from I think it was Hartmut uh, showing us um, the different batteries and how they are growing. What we haven't shown is that the shift in household batteries from less critical, fire critical alkali mangan to this extremely more fire critical, if wrongly treated, lithium ion and batteries. And therefore, there is a huge, huge uh, threat on if we keep this high rate on batteries going on different routes um, uh, in, into the waste stream. Next share, please. Uh, um, uh, next slide, please. And I just want to show you on some example. We see increasing, increasing fires in the industry, but also on the collection part, but also in other um, in other parts where batteries are mistreated because they are not going the right way back. And on the next slide, um, uh, uh, university study in Austria, which have uh, found out that we have in average one lithium ion battery per ton in residual waste, one battery. And this has, uh, has a significant uh, likelihood on probability of fire damage um, if you have um, these batteries um, in this residual waste. And thanks to our progress moving away from landfills, moving into recycling and mechanical plants, uh, we see an increasing risk of fire with these batteries um, because the batteries per, per se are very safe. But if you throw them in a, in a, in a waste collection truck or in a, in a shredder, um, then they are not so safe anymore because they are not built for this treatment process and they keep so, many, en so much energy that they, um, the potential of, uh, of a fire is drastically increasing. And if we follow this study and make an estimation of what we can estimate of potential fire incidents per year over the European Union, I think there are two good reasons now for a, for a, a, a deposit scheme. First of all, to get the material and secondary to protect the environments because every one of these fire incidents, they do so much harm uh, for the environment that this is an absolutely key. Therefore, we think everything, uh, um, uh, we, we had to go on the top level. We had to collect every battery as possible. And we have learned in other schemes that collection schemes are a good way to, um, uh, to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, throwing away of available goods. So that was it in a, in, in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. You made a number of recommendations there. Is there a top recommendation? Is it about these collection rates? What would you say was the one thing that you really want to make sure uh, happens in this regulation and that it's uh, not diluted down? Yeah. So if I, if I think there, hmm, there are a lot of a, a lot of interesting topics on the uh, there, but if I say if I say this point, which is for the industry, but also for the environment and for the society and i don't want to be the guy who said I, I have i've done a compromise on collection rates and therefore we have harm for environment or maybe even people uh, on this so the top top number one is collect as much as possible and don't step back behind plastic um, be at least on par level this bit Thank you very, very much, uh, Ralph. Now let me big, uh, bring in Alessandro Danesi, who's commercial director of the SE Val Group in Italy, who's going to explain what his company is doing for the circular economy and his thoughts on this proposed uh, regulation. So, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for inviting me. So, let me share the presentation.
Do you see now? Yes, yes, we see. Thank you. Okay, okay. So my name is Alessandro Danesi. I'm uh, the market director for Sable. Sable is a, a family-owned uh, company. Who oh, is the next share? If you can move the next okay, slide. Okay, okay. It's a family-owned company. Uh, it was established uh, 35 years ago in uh, the power lines, uh, construction and maintenance. And 20 years ago, uh, established also an environmental division. Now, this environmental division uh, is uh, uh, operating seven plants all over Italy and treating uh, more than 130,000 tons per year of uh, mainly we batteries and other industrial waste. Uh, there is just one of uh, out of these uh, seven plants uh, um, treating batteries. Uh, we are one of the few plants in Italy. There are three sorting plants for batteries from household batteries. Um, just to give you an overview of our domestic market, um, battery recycling is uh, uh, mainly industrial and automotive. Uh, the total volume is uh, not perfectly known. Uh, for sure, is more than 170,000 tons per year. Uh, the domestic and portable batteries are uh, 11,000 tons per year. More or less, half of this is uh, voluntary and professional collection, by, let's say, managed by collective schemes, mainly made of lead lead acid batteries. The other 50% is what we really, um, let's say, uh, consider portable batteries. Uh, two thirds are from a municipal collection point, and uh, the rest is um, um, a program that the, the, the National Clearing House is uh, carrying out uh, that allows waste storages and all we recyclers to give uh, to the system for free, the portable batteries coming out of the treatment. Uh, out of this 50%, uh, you can see that uh, alkaline batteries are still over 70%, but uh, we see Li-ion and lithium batteries growing and growing year by year. Uh, here you can see some of the data. What Seval is doing with batteries? Uh, we are doing a manual pre-sorting and sorting of domestic batteries. We are um, uh, shredding the uh, big part of this, the, this, uh, the alkaline and uh, zinc carbon batteries, and we take out black mass, steel, plastic, and brass. Then we uh, put up some years ago an electrochemical, hydrometallurgical process for zinc and manganese recycling, but uh, uh, it was um, a mistake because uh, the cost and the revenues were not balanced, so it's not more in use. And a couple of years ago, we applied and we erected a pilot plant for primary lithium batteries treatment. Some figures, uh, three, more than 3,000 uh, tons collected and sorted. That means uh, around 60% 60, 60 of the real market. Uh, out of these, more than 2,000 tons uh, shredded, means alkaline and zinc carbon. And then uh, we have uh, two, uh, let's say, projects. One is uh, this uh, life bath. Uh, it is um, a pilot plant for the, the, the primary lithium treating. And then we uh, will just launch a, a research and development project about the X-ray sorting for the let's say, domestic batteries. These are, let's say, a scheme of our processes. As, you, as I told you before, uh, we are doing a pre-selection that is, uh, um, the target is to take out what we call the foreign material that is really high, because the quality of the collection is poor. Uh, this is a matter of uh, education more than uh, a matter of rules. Then we have uh, screening by size and shape. 
and then we do it, we are doing the selection. Still, we are doing a manual selection. Out of this, we, we have uh, the nickel cadmium, lithium ion, and nickel metal hydrate uh, batteries, and we send to external partners all over Europe. Then we have uh, the lithium, and uh, these lithium batteries, uh, uh, the first lot has already treated in the last months, uh, are treated in a cryogenic shredding. So we freeze the batteries, we shred them, and we, in this way, we control the reactions uh, from the elements inside. Then all the, 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 the materials that we take out, ferrous, non-ferrous, and black mass, are sent to a metallurgic unit. And uh, we have now the first lot of lithium carbonate. We are now looking for a new solution for these materials. Uh, the, the best part, the most part of uh, the, the other batteries, alkaline, are shredded, and uh, we go to foundries with steel and brass. And uh, with the black mass, we stop the, our unit for recycling, and uh, we are now going to external wilds, wilds processes. Uh, there is a project to go to agriculture, but the, the permit uh, path is very long and very complicated. Now, I have to. Uh, I, I try to to give my idea about which are the missing bricks in this uh, uh, regulation proposal. Uh, my vision is that uh, what we need is to share our recycling infrastructure uh, across Europe. Uh, we cannot think to have. Uh, with so limited collection and so limited volume, one plant for each type of batteries in each country. Uh, I think that for this, we have a, a target that is to behave as a, an, as a country all over Europe, also in waste. Uh, I have put some ideas on uh, this uh, approach. The first is that uh, I think that we need to give uh, a refresh on classification of batteries, because after more than 10 years, uh, market grow, market change, and now the, the existing uh, European uh, codes for batteries are not more sticking to reality. And the second point is that um, we have to facilitate the shipment. Uh, we need to have a safe shipment, but uh, we cannot have the current uh, um, situation. We, we have uh, up to one year to having approved uh, notification for shipping some type of batteries all over the, the Europe, not uh, in China, not in the US, but in Europe. And uh, a single shipment can cost over 10,000 euro. And we have uh, cost of uh, transport higher for notification, for notificated transport. We have uh, cost of insurance, guarantees. We have uh, every kind of cost, administrative cost. And this is uh, uh, killing uh, uh, European infrastructure of recycling. And uh, again, an idea, if we really think that uh, what is coming out from recycling is a strategic, a strategic for our countries, I think we have to define what is uh, safe to be shifted and what is to be very controlled. If we have, uh, like in other uh, segments, uh, uh, in the end of waste regulation for black masses coming from batteries with the specific um, requirements of purity, of uh, quality, then we can have uh, uh, shipment um, that are more easy, not, not so complicated uh, like today. Uh, and in the end of waste regulation, I think is uh, one of the missing brick in this regulation. And the last point is related to the quality of uh, the black masses that we are able to take out. These, these are depending on the quality of the selection. But the selection today is quite difficult. Optical machines have some limits. And uh, uh, we, we experienced um, hundreds, thousands of brands 
and uh, um, type of batteries. Uh, could be easy uh, for us, it's a proposal that we are bringing everywhere when, when we talk with uh, um, rulers. Uh, can be easy to have a mark. And I see that in the, this new regulation proposal, there is a, a labeling chapter, a labeling article. But uh, what is missing is to mark with a color the type of battery. This can help a lot the quality of the selection and, in, uh, and the cost of the selection and the quality of the black masses that we can obtain with, uh, let's say, high purity selection. Uh, it's all from my side. Thank you for, uh, for uh, listening. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandro. And yes, we hear the frustration with uh, the red tape for the uh, shipments indeed. Let me now ask uh, for our uh, public affairs manager from a Finnish company called Fortum uh, to tell us about what his company is doing. Let me give the floor to Mr. Yanni Koivisto uh, about your innovative technologies and also some of your ideas about what's in the regulation or just as Alessandro has been saying, the missing bricks, as he put them, the gaps in the regulation. Uh, Yanni, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. It's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and uh, good afternoon on my behalf as well. So, so I'm telling you a little bit about uh, our company and our battery recycling process as, a, as well as our views on on uh, on the current commission proposal a few words about fortum in the beginning we are we are an energy company by origin with activities in in more than 40 countries around the globe and, and we are the third largest producer of co2 free electri electricity in europe we are all also a forerunner in, in a circular economy uh, with with advanced recycling and waste management solutions and and this is uh, where our business line on on battery recycling relates to and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Next slide, please. So you can see the structure rough rough structure of our recycling process where our focus is especially on on EV batteries where the expected road rate will be huge. We've chosen a, a non-thermal low CO2 approach in our, in our whole battery recycling. Uh, mechanical processing uh, is used in, in our Ikalinen plant instead of uh, smelting used by some operators. And, and our, our process produces higher recycling rates and lower CO2 emissions. Uh, the chemical and, and mineral components from the mechanical process, uh, the so-called black mass, is, is then delivered to Fortum's NATO processing facility, which is located in Finland, in Harjavalta, where a hydrometallurgical process is applied to create a new recycled raw materials that can be used in, in battery products. And uh, regarding this process, we are also confident that we can we can achieve and meet the high recycling rate set by set by commission in in the proposal. Thirdly, uh, the thing worth to mention is that uh, Fortum has got the whole waste value chain covered, whether they are hazardous or non-hazardous waste streams from the process other than those most valuable active materials, which everybody is looking after. I'm referring to other metals or plastics. We can either recycle them or recover the energy out of them in our own facilities in, in Finland. Next slide, please. Uh, the slide is about uh, our hydrometallurgical process, which I, I already mentioned. But uh, one one thing to add, and it is also worth noticing, while while people are estimating the availability of, of recycled content for batteries, uh, is that our, our flexible process uh, can also treat other industrial waste streams, 
contain, containing nickel and uh, cobalt, which can be recycled back to battery industry. So uh, our source waste stream is known not only the end of life batteries. Next, please. So now, now, now to the uh, commission proposal on, on batteries, a few words about that and, and, and our views on how it could support our business and, and the whole, whole EU-wide battery value chain. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the commission on, on the ambitious proposal and, and we truly believe that this proposal will support the rapid growth of, of European battery recycling industry and will be an enable for, for the sustainable European battery value chain. Uh, we welcome the targets on recycled content in EV and, uh, and other batteries in the new proposal and, and this is a key message to, to both to increase the demand of recycled raw materials and, and at the same time speed up the much needed investments in, in battery recycling. Similar targets would be considered for, for portable lithium ion batteries, at, at least for the bigger ones in, in our, our view. In, in the same context, uh, talking about uh, increasing the demand for, for recyclates, uh, uh, the modulation requirements in EPR seems rewarding the use of recycled materials should be mandatory. Uh, again, here we support the approach taken by the Commission. Uh, and lastly, uh, we find it important for, for the level playing field that the enforcement of market surveillance is effective on EU imports regarding new batteries and, and raw materials. For example, for, for the uh, market to work, work well. And, and equally, it's important to take uh, measures to prevent illegal shipments of waste batteries to third countries uh, to, to prevent the leakage of, of battery materials. Uh, for these purposes, new waste codes for the new types of batteries should be included to the EU list of waste, and this should be considered while the revision on waste shipment regulation is ongoing. Uh, this is this is my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Yani. And um, what would you say would be your main recommendation uh, to the to the council and to the ITRI committee and the Environment Committee as this uh, regulation goes uh, through the uh, uh, scrutiny of those uh, of those committees? Yeah, th thank you for the question. Uh, for our business, I would say that the most important thing in this piece of legislation is uh, is its ability to create demand for the recycled raw materials. And if we are concerned about something, we are a bit concerned about whether the final reg regulation will be able to, to deliver that. Uh, the proposal also has all the right elements. So, so my message to the co-legislators would, would be that maintain the same level of ambitious, ambition as the Commission has, has, has taken it into, into proposal. Let me uh, bring back Alessandro and uh, Ralph just uh, to get some clear understanding on the collection uh, targets. I think, Ralph, you said you wanted much higher uh, collection targets. Did I remember the figure of 90%? Uh, uh, Was that the case, Ralph? Much higher um, collection targets? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think now. Yes, that was correct, Claire. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is really the comparison with the EU uh, regulative on plastic on PET, where we aim for 90%. Uh, it's the same here. Um, the sky is the limit, uh, but the resources are important. Um, and uh, 
um, and uh, uh, also the, the fire risk that we have. And to Jose, uh, even if we say this will only be a few percent compared to the 70 to the 70 percent that is introduced somewhere in the future, I think with uh, introduction of uh, of an MDS, uh, we uh, we would be able to reach these targets way earlier um, uh, in in this in this topic. And we had to get them out of the landfills. We had to get them out of the residual waste, and we had to get them out. He was completely right. We had to get them out of the all the small electronic components um, uh, so that we don't lose. Uh, a stream on this where they then got on a shredder or on whatever on whatever it is. Yes, 90% the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. And what, what about you, Alessandro? Uh, do you agree with Ralph that you would might like much more ambitious collection targets, perhaps as much as 90%? Under percent uh, with uh, with him. No, the point is that uh, um, we are currently also uh, joking a little bit with. Uh, um, recovery um, the collection rate because uh, um, when we calculated this collection rate we also include the portable lead batteries and uh, out of that under percent are recovered so the real domestic collection rate is uh, really lower than what we uh, we declare now so I think that uh, a, a very long step has to be done in the collection rate. And we have to be really, really ambitious on that. Yanni, more ambition on collection targets, would you like? Yeah, I can support my colleagues Colleagues here. Nothing nothing more to add. So we, we heard from uh, Maria uh, from the ITRI committee that uh, it was all about, um, you know, investment and innovation uh, for uh, industry. Uh, Yanni, these mandatory recycled uh, content in portable batteries, is this absolutely crucial uh, for you so that you're able to make the right investment decisions? Uh, in portable batteries, uh, I would say they would they would help a lot, but the but, um, most important thing regarding the uh, Mandatory recycled content lies lies in in other than portable batteries. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if this regulation is adopted, is Fortum envisaging uh, you know other investments? What sort of investments would you have to make? Well, uh, I can't obviously promise promise anybody that we are going to invest anything, but. It's no no secret either that we've been investing in in recent years for for the battery recycling business and and this is something we aim to be in and hope to be able to scale up with the growing market. Alessandro, what about you? What can you tell us about uh, you know uh, new investments with the growing uh, market? Because it's obviously going to be a sector that's going to be driven by innovation yes we are looking uh, forward to to invest and to develop new technologies about this um, what is a little bit worrying me is that in this regulation the recovery rate, the mandatory recovery rate are put on the, the recycler shoulders i think that this is a misunderstanding because of uh, who is controlling the waste and who is monitoring the recycling are the collective schemes, it means the producers uh, schemes. I think that uh, this uh, mandatory uh, recycling rate has to be, let's say, monitored and put on, the, on their shoulders. Let, let me see what your colleagues think about that. Uh, Ralph, what's your view about this mandatory recycling rate? Uh, should this uh, be something for the recyclers or, as Alessandro says, for the producers? Uh, I, I, I think uh, one of the most important things is also to give consumer, um, consumer the right of choice is that we declare the products how much uh, recycled content then they have. There's one thing to make a product recyclable, but there's another thing to declare how much recycling content is is this. So for us generally in industry, you say if you if you create a label or a 
clearly visible uh, uh, message of how much recycling content is into a new product, I think also a lot of the consumers uh, will vote for this and therefore we create a market uh, for this material and not forcing somebody to um, um, to use the material that we are recycling, which should be should be a demand driven area. So that is therefore we say uh, on the producer side and help them a little bit with some regulation um, um, uh, and an easy to see label on the consumer side uh, or at least transparent uh, message how much recycling content um, does a product have. In the chat, interestingly, uh, the audience uh, gives 100% support uh, to the color code. There seems to be a consensus on that idea, uh, Al Alessandro. Ralph, uh, your view on uh, the pr proposal from Alessandro for this uh, color code of batteries. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alessandro, uh, good support. Uh, also, uh, we are very, very, uh, there's everything about machine readable. Um, content and as far as I understand, Alessandro, you are color coding the chemistry on the um, on the battery, um, and this is one thing. Uh, but in addition, I would like to have a color coded QR code <laughs> uh, that uh, because the uh, uh, the advantage on on QR code reading and in generally on. Um, on machine readable content can also be RFID and bigger packages in order to make um, a very, very good decision on, on how the products are separated once they are collected. Um, and we know for all for sure we want to get, we don't want to have mercury, we don't want to have cadmium. So the easier this is, uh, the better uh, the black mass can become a product with guaranteed, um, with guaranteed content. So. Full support, a little bit increased on maybe uh, again more better machine readable, but uh, cool idea. Um, uh, so uh, can help at least in the process. Mm. Um, I mean, what also is of course is very important. Alessandro mentioned that the quality of the collection relies on the education of the consumer. So I'm just wondering, all three gentlemen, and then I'll take some of the questions from the uh, audience, uh, Ralph, and then I'll go to Alessandra and Yanni. What are your views on how to empower, incentivize, and inform consumers and improve their behavior? Uh, Ralph, to you, and then to Alessandro and Yanni. Yeah, so uh, it, it's definitely one, the first of uh, most important thing is educated consumers are taking better decisions. So this um, um, this is one point, and we can see in on on other uh, examples that uh, with well educated uh, consumers, you also can reach very high collection rates without uh, a, a mandatory scheme. But there's a certain level when it stops. Um, uh, then typically everything that you feel in your pocket in your um, uh, how we call this? Where your money, your money pocket uh, is, and then um, this is a good education because uh, it represents uh, it, it represents something that has a value also for it. Because we always had to think that we still are a society that we have um, an, a certain percentage of people, regardless how much you put in education, they are just not adopting to the idea of well behaving in uh, towards waste towards waste management. Uh, so, but generally, yeah, number one is always be, um, be the good educated consumer. Mm. Alessandro, uh, how are we going to better educate uh, uh, consumers so that you can collect more and recycle more? Hey, often we, let's say, open the plant to schools or visitors. And uh, I think that the key word is awareness. Most of them, they really do not know what is happening to the material after they dispose it. So I think that uh, awareness is the, the, the key point and the, um, the people have to know what is happening afterward. This is my view. My view. Yanni, as a public affairs manager, I imagine that this is uh, part of your remit, but how do you change consumer behavior? Oh. Uh, I can second what the gentleman be before me were saying that uh, consumer education works to a certain point, uh, but 
uh, one important thing regarding uh, consumers returning returning ways to to uh, recovery is that it needs to be easy if the consumer needs to take too much effort for returning goods goods for recycling uh, it won't work absolutely and now let me take some of the audience questions here um in practical terms how do the different speakers suggest tackling the losses of waste portable batteries a considerable share of waste portable batteries is lost due to export and of course uh, to uh, the the uh, electric and electronic uh, equipment so does it make sense to take these waste batteries into account in the calculation yani do you have any thoughts on that well uh not not really no because uh, as i said we are focusing currently mainly on ev batteries um alessandro sorry can you repeat the question because yeah. Uh, yeah. the question was um how do you suggest tackling the losses of waste portable uh, batteries because a considerable share of waste portable batteries is lost due to export Ah, I see that um, um, more than export, I think the, the, the loss is in the waste, uh, in the waste basket. Uh, the most of the losses are to incinerators. So I think that uh, what Uni said before, we need to reduce uh, what we can and even more the effort that uh, the people uh, must uh, put in uh, giving the, the waste in the, to the right solution. Absolutely. And uh, Ralph, any thoughts on, uh, on, on that, on how do we tackle the losses of waste portable batteries? Yeah. We, have, we have two, as, as you have seen in Hartmann, two sources where we lost batteries despite municipal waste. It's export and um, the electro, um, the small e and e-waste. Uh, for me, uh, in principle, we had on the on the export issues. There are clearly regulations that e-waste is not to be exported um, uh, under unless there are certain conditions, including batteries. I mean, if we have regulations in place in all of our countries, enforcement would really help um, um, to not getting all this e-scrap uh, towards two countries where it should not be belong. I think that's um, um, that's an issue of policymaker and enforcement put more focus on this. Uh, we always see the plastic that goes to Malaysia or all these others that need to be more focused on this. And the second one, it has to be, it can be considered that we have an own regulations of um, electronic waste without the cable. So the products which don't have a cable because they uh, per se contain a battery um, and rethinking whether we have the electronic industry giving us the batteries or thinking around that the first thing is before they can recycle this, that they have to prove that they have to remove the batteries out of these specific categories. Um, I think that would help um, um, a lot um, because an increasing part of the batteries, if you look on the, on the new batteries issued, a lot of them are in products where they are not the classic AA, AAA batteries, but they are an integral part of the product. And if we see this increase of these products and I'm not steering against it, all our other numbers are, will, will be very difficult um, to reach because these products and these batteries are gone thrown away with the, with the product surrounding it. So that's a, a thing that we really have to think very carefully what we can do about this. I mean, do you envisage that in the future there's going to be much more cooperation with the manufacturers? And, and how do you see that playing out? I think at one point of time, and I know it's a very, very difficult, and I'm happy not being a policymaker for this, but if everything becomes electrified and batterified, and if we if we make the battery a so integral part of the product that you virtually can't um, can't separate it, then we, we face a significant problem. So maybe really on one level, there had to be certain regulation on the product manufacturers that uh, at least there is a, a way of uh, retrieving the battery out of the products. Might it be a, 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 a mower or a, 
das how can I say the dust keeper uh, uh, vacuum cleaner or, or all these other things, but also in smaller in 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 um, batteries in uh, re remote controls so that you can get rid of them and this will be that will be um, a very difficult big piece because without the cooperation uh, with the industry that they produce these goods in a way that you can separate it it will be very difficult mm. alessandro what would be your thoughts on um, increased cooperation with manufacturers going forward i think that ralph uh, touch a very critical point. Um, a lot of uh, fire events in the we recycling industry is coming from uh, the, the, the impossibility uh, to have uh, we on the side and batteries on the other side. And uh, shredding we with batteries uh, is bringing to that event. Um, cooperation with um, producers it's quite uh, a difficult task, uh, difficult and tough because uh, they are driven by uh, marketing and the consumer needs. And we are in the end of the process. So we're not taking account in the very beginning phase of the designing of the product. Uh, I think that we have to act in this way. We need to have a separate collection for the object and the products that cannot be separated by uh, battery from the appliance. In this way, we can put the right cost of recycling on the, who is producing this kind of material. And uh, this will, will bring the producer uh, to an awareness of uh, it's working to go for this direction. It's really a need to have these not separable batteries in, in my appliances, because there is a cost in the end. There is a cost, there is people that has to remove uh, batteries from an object that may be uh, as a weight of uh, 100 grams. And uh, this is a huge cost. So I think that the solution is to have a separate collection and address real costs to producers. We, we have quite a few questions uh, for uh, Maria from ITRE committee and uh, for Jose Riso, who unfortunately have uh, had to uh, leave us. So apologies for that. Let me, however, um, ask all speakers a question that's come in. So perhaps if I begin with you, Yane, on do you support a classification of all lithium ion batteries as hazardous waste? in order to avoid export to non-OECD countries. Do you have a thought mm -hmm. on uh, that, Yanni? Well, uh, as I'm, I'm aware of that, for sure, uh, lithium-ion batteries do have uh, hazardous properties, so m perhaps this classification would make sense. But, but the latter part of the sentence is not something I, I fully support because we are of course pro free competition and, and our our lobbying doesn't aim to uh, close markets but it would be very important that that the enforcement and interpretation within the internal market is is same in every, every member state mm. yes yes in indeed uh ralph what about uh, what is your view on uh, classification of all lithium ion batteries as hazardous waste uh, in order to avoid export to non OECD countries. Mm -hmm. um, Jana doesn't agree with uh, avoiding export to non OECD countries, but certainly he agrees with the classification as hazardous waste. What, what's your view? Um, I think it, it's really uh, similar to, to Jana's. The most important thing is that we have a unique, uh, unified regulation within the EU whether the one way or the other way, because the patchwork on different regulations, sometimes on, on sub counties in the country, that's, that's the absolutely nightmare. And it really leads to the wrong behavior uh, and, and cherry picking of, of certain things. Generally, uh, speaking of uh, the potential threat of lithium ion batteries, um, we, uh, we obey that they are Hesedas products. Um, in generally, therefore, I say not 
not because of the reason of non-OECD, um, um, because I think if, if, you're, if we are really clever, we can recycle, especially the black mass up to a level then that it can reach product, state, product status and therefore you can export the final product. Uh, and I think that should be all the same end of waste um, status. And therefore, um, um, this is, uh, I think, in our opinion, the right way to go. Uh, classified as status waste all over Europe in every single place, having a level playing field, um, but aim for such a high quality in the recycling process that the things that we recycle can reach end of waste status mm -hmm. and therefore be uh, market worldwide. Uh, fair, thank you, Ralph. Alessandro, wh what is your view on the classification of all lithium ion batteries as hazardous waste? Uh, this is a difficult question because in a perfect world, I would say yes. It's, an, it's, uh, it's something that has to be classified as hazardous waste. But as a, it is a matter of uh, Basel Convention. If just Europe is saying uh, dangerous, then we are creating problems in, uh, in comparing uh, what we are doing and what the rest of the world is doing. And uh, this is very important. Uh, what I'm afraid more is that if we declare this, then we really stop uh, the exchange of uh, batteries across Europe. So. In a perfect world, we say yes, but uh, with, with um, let's say, facilitated uh, shipment within Europe and uh, fast updating of existing permits, because uh, the risk is to block the industry for two, three years. Alessandro, thank you very much. Yanni, thank you very much. And Ralph, uh, for answering uh, the audience questions. There's just a couple of comments from the audience. Uh, I would like to read to you. They say there has to be a value in the collection product to make it more appealing. A refund system would help for sure. And let's cross our fingers that the stock value stays high. As long as these two things work together, you'll be successful with high collection and recycling rates resulting in good business. And another comment from the audience, the problem will be in future when the automotive industry will control their own recycling streams and then all the other independent recyclers will suffer to get enough feed for their recycling plant. Uh, so that's, uh, yes, really moving uh, the discussion forward perhaps from uh, today's proposed regulation. I would like to thank all of our speakers uh, from uh, the ERCA Institute, from the European Commission, uh, from the ITRI Committee, and uh, our three leading voices from the industry, as well as to the audience for all their very informed comments and questions. I would now like to hand over to FIAD's Secretary General, Valérie Plaine-Maison, who's going to wrap up the session. Valérie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for all of us to having been with us, the panelists, and also uh, the audience. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, I think many, many things were said this afternoon, so I'm not going to repeat everything. Uh, I just see that uh, it's not surprising uh, that circular economy relies on building an industrial vision uh, with policy measures uh, such as collection, mandatory recycled contents, eco-design. These are very strong uh, incentives and, and policy measures. And together, we need to have strong markets. So it has to be based on the market um, to allow for us to make investments uh, to allow for innovation, to allow for a learning curve, and to allow for, for the waste management to capture the needed waste flows. Uh, also, having said that, we see that implementation and very concrete and, and practical issues uh, are on the table. So it's about classification, it's about codes, 
uh, it's about the regime of shipments, uh, procedures, it's about calculation method of the recycling efficiency. So we need to have all those practical tools also to, to properly implement the political, uh, the political measures. Uh, so this, 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 uh, this would be the, the, the wrap up. Um, I think we, we haven't really addressed a big thing, uh, but we will do in the coming months and years, which is um, cooperating all the industries together, our industry with the manufacturer's industry, because this is key, this is crucial that both sectors speak to each other, because we are going to make it happen two sectors. Uh, and this is something which has to, to take place at national level or at EU level uh, in an informal way. It has not to be compulsory, but it, it has to um, it has to take place. Um, we see also that it, it came also in the discussions that we need clear and strong signals. So we need that the effort not be diluted in the complexity of this uh, new regulation, which is uh, a, a single and unique text. So the, the level of ambitious of ambition, sorry, needs to be high uh, so that everyone has the visibility for 2030 and 2035 to build this, uh, this very uh, important um, frame. So this is a uh, Yes, th these are my, my main uh, uh, recommendations <laughs> as a person who makes a, a wrap up. Uh, I really want to, to thank you all for uh, this discussion uh, and these uh, ideas. Also, the audience for having put a lot of, um, of questions on the table. Uh, and that will be, that will be it for, for, for me this afternoon. I think it was a very rich um, session of, of, of uh, exchange of ideas. So, Claire, I give the floor to you for a very, very last word. And thank you very much, everyone. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Valerie. And uh, my last word is just to say that FIAD is going to organize an online event on the key role of waste to energy for a more circular economy. And that's going to take place on Monday, the 12th of April between four o'clock and six o'clock Central European time. So do check the website for more information as the registration is going to open this week. So thank you very much for being such an attentive audience uh, for our discussion on recycling batteries, energizing the green transition. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>